It was November of 1966, the Sunday before Election Day all over this country, when a 37-year-old Dr. John Burton Wolf stood in this pulpit and looked out at basically an entirely white congregation of Tulsans and delivered this sermon titled, Black Power, White Backlash. It was, as I said earlier, a time when the ideas of nonviolent protest that Martin Luther King was putting forward and through the civil rights movement was being thrown into question by many who were saying, is it worth it? Can we stand this? And um, for those who don't know about that part of the history, the Black Power Movement began as a movement and a slogan for black people. It was a slogan to say to black people, say it proud, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. It was, it was a, a movement to try to help black people in the United States to say, I have power, I have agency, I am a man. People were protesting with signs, black people saying, I am a man. So the Black Power Movement and the Black Power slogan was something that was aimed at black people for black people, but as we'll hear from Dr. Wolf, it, its power over white people and the response by white people became more dominant than the actual movement uh, itself in certain ways in terms of how it impacted our society, not because of what the movement was about, but because of how, what white people were afraid of. Dr. Wolf began. The words black power are strange words in a way because they were meant to be a rallying cry for the embattled African American in the slums, tenant farms, and ghettos of America. Instead, they became a hue and cry of white backlash. Each time today that the words black power are uttered as a rallying slogan for African Americans, a tenfold number of dissident whites respond. Almost from the beginning of the civil rights movement, there have been warnings that if the African American population pursued its sit-ins, the picketing, the demonstrating under the leadership of Martin Luther King Jr. and others, they would only succeed in building up further resentment and resistance against them. They may have thought that they were getting somewhere by their marches and the nonviolent resistance, but all they were really going to get, we were told, out of this was a militant resistance because sooner or later these demonstrations would precipitate violence, said the white naysayers. They will lead to rioting and disturbance. Then all those whites who had secretly and even quietly been on the side of African Americans and this movement, their faith in it will have soured and African Americans will lose more than they have gained, it was said. And yet, despite what these naysayers have warned, the civil rights movement went along, knocking over precedent after precedent, garnering victory over victory, until in the short span of a dozen years, unbelievable concessions had been made, laws passed, old and seemingly unbreachable social and political patterns were dissolved. And then came the words, black power. And the whites found their war cry, their rallying words. The white backlash had finally come into its own. The great I told you so was on. Before I go any further, I'd like to tell you what the words black power mean to me. Never mind what Stokely Carmichael and David McKissick say they mean. What they mean to me is that the African American has had enough of this nonviolent resistance business. Enough of turning the other cheek when white hoodlums spit on them. Enough of taking the verbal abuse, the slanders, the threats, 
much less the cattle proddings, the tear gas, the fists and blackjacks of white citizens and their policemen. I will tell you clearly what I think about this. If I ever walked into a restaurant and was refused a seat for any reason other than that the restaurant was full or that after five o'clock you were expected to wear a necktie, I would breathe fire right into the major domo's face. As a matter of fact, I've done just that. As I recall, it was during the Second World War. I was an enlisted man, a single man, second class. I went on liberty in New York City, and I went into a very swanky hotel restaurant early one evening, myself and another swabby. The maitre d' looked at us, and with that impetuous tone, which is the hallmark of head waiters, especially in New York City, he informed us that we could not be admitted without a reservation. So we thanked him and we departed only to decide that we would see if we might just possibly make a reservation. So we called on the phone and we gave the desk our names, Mr. Securely Fixed in front of them. And would you believe it? We had no trouble getting reservations. We had a drink down the street and we went back to the hotel where we were met with the same head waiter. We told him that we had reservations and gave him our names, Mr. Fleming and Mr. Wolf. Of course, there were no reservations. Someone had made a terrible mistake, we were told. He was awfully sorry. Whereupon, that one sixteenth Irish in me went from green to scarlet. And I remember saying partly at the top of my voice, well, if it's the policy of this two-bit restaurant not to seat enlisted men, then you can take it and you can, and it's blank in his manuscript what he said next. (laughs) He went on. I wonder if any of you other white folks have ever had such an experience. Never mind you ex-officers and gentlemen. Yes, I'll tell you what the words black power mean to me. If one of my children ever came home crying because someone had called him a name or had not let him be part of some activity or another that all the other kids were a part of, had not let him come into their house with his friends or go on a bus or come into the schoolyard... I would be so mad that I would probably come close to committing mayhem. As a matter of fact, that almost happened once. My daughter Kathy came home crying because some good Christian, some true blue American down the street, had told her that she would not be welcome to play with their daughter because we were Unitarians and Democrats. That time I turned blue. If, I, if it had not been for my wife's even temper, I would have marched down the street and dismembered that miserable specimen of demented humanity. Something that has never happened to me, and it better not, no one has ever threatened my wife or my children. But if they ever do, you will have to bail me out of jail because I will track them down and take them apart. Nor will I have the slightest scruple about taking the law into my own hands. At least I think that's the way I would react. I know it's the way I would feel. How about the rest of you white folks? In other words, my natural reaction to discrimination against my children or against some threat to my family's well-being would be anything but nonviolent. I would no more turn the other cheek than fly. And neither, I presume, would you. 
Or supposing that almost everywhere I went, I would have to watch my step because if I overstepped the bounds that were somehow set there against me, I would be called a name or spat upon or otherwise put in my place. Supposing that I, a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, were made to feel unwanted in the theaters, in the public buildings, in the churches of my community, what do you suppose I would do? I'll tell you what I would do. I would organize, and I would start thinking about ways to overthrow the whole cotton-picking system that treated me that way. I would organize all the rest of my white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, and I would elect a congressman, and I would elect a governor, and I would elect me a mayor and a chief of police, and I would corner enough capital to buy out the stores and the theaters that offended me. Or I might get another group of my white Anglo-Saxon Protestant friends together and we'd stop trading at those places. We'd open up some stores and theaters of our own. That's what I'd do and a lot more. And that's what I think black power means. For those who are younger, just a quick note here. That's what the black power movement was trying to do. They were trying to organize black people to to shop in black businesses, to support black businesses, to start black businesses, to begin to build some electoral power for advocacy in the system of America. That was the true spirit of black power, and that was a big part of the threat to white people as they saw black people self-segregating uh, in their own businesses and, and, and shunning white businesses and starting to change the system to, to be something different and taking this idea of self-determination to heart and really saying, we can do this ourselves. Back to Dr. Wolf. And I can understand it, as I know the rest of you white folks can understand it, because we invented it. What is more, we have a corner on it. This is precisely where the African-American in the civil rights struggle has goofed. What he really ought to do with the words black power is communicate to us whites that he is human too. His reactions to discrimination, to hate and violence against himself and his children are no different than anyone else's. But somehow this idea which these words black power were meant to get across to us and to people of all races has gotten lost. Now I want to interject another point right here, which is that it seems that history has proven Dr. Wolf wrong on this one point. His overarching sermon is, is brilliant and makes a great point. But a few years ago, a movement began here in the 21st century among African Americans to do just what Dr. Wolf is describing. The slogan was, and still is, Black Lives Matter. There's nothing violent or threatening about these words. In fact, they convey exactly what Dr. Wolf suggests, that African Americans are as human as everyone else. And yet a strong white backlash formed against these words and against this movement for equality. Immediately, white people started yelling, all lives matter, and tearing down and defacing signs that said black lives matter. As if saying black lives matter somehow denies someone else's equality. So even though Dr. Wolf's overall message stands the test of time, this one point that somehow a slogan and a philosophy that would convey that black people are as human as everyone else would be effective has sadly not proven to be the case even now in the 21st century. So there's something much deeper at work. Nevertheless, returning to Dr. Wolf's message from 1966, the words black power are loaded because they put the struggle squarely in the hostile camp. As I say, we whites practically invented the word power. So the struggle has been brought over onto our battlefield. We whites know what power means because we have been employing white power for centuries. We have taken out our resentment and anger. We have used the full weight of the electorate, of money, of influence, of boycotts, which we have been separate but equal to have our way. 
We know only too well what such power can do. We are experts in its use. So when an African-American resorts to black power, whites have him right where they want him. If he has elected to fight on our own terms, on our own ground, then the gloves are off. So long as Martin Luther King was in the saddle, whites could, they could fight back and complain, but the struggle was being fought on another battlefield altogether. The struggle was being fought not on the battlefield of white power or black power, but on a higher field. Remember what Dr. King said? We have been able to stand up in the face of our most violent opponents and say, we cannot in all good conscience obey your unjust laws because non-cooperation with evil is as much a moral obligation as cooperation with good. So threaten our children, bomb our homes, And as difficult as it is, we will still love you. But be you assured that we will wear you down by our capacity to suffer. And one day, we will not only win freedom for ourselves, but we will so appeal to your hearts and your conscience that we will win you in the process. And our victory will be a double victory. On this battlefield, white people were defeated before we began. What defense could we use against such weapons? We were helpless. We had no defense. We possessed no weapon with which to counterattack. But now, now it's different. Black power that seeks to shun nonviolence, that whites can reckon with. That we can handle because we can meet it on our own ground and with weapons that we have in great supply. For some, it's a victory that the opponents have come around to our way of doing things so that now white people need not be ashamed any longer of using great might. Might could never have won over right. But over might, might against might, power against power, on this battlefield, white people have the undeniable advantage. I will tell you what black power means to me. It is like white power. It is human nature. Solving problems with the power of might. How else have we free Anglo-Saxon Protestant Americans won all all of our privileges and preserve them? We've learned how to use power and wield might. And with the cry of black power, white people now feel justified in turning loose all the white power we have at our disposal. All we needed was an excuse. As long as black people were taking the unassailable, higher moral ground, white people had no good defense. White resistance and white violence continued to be exposed as immoral on the streets and on our television sets. And more and more white people could not escape what was plain for all to see. That the danger and the evil lurking in our society was not in black people, but in white culture. But with the words black power and the insinuation of violence, the moral high ground is easily thrown into question. And what had become the inescapable realization of the inhumanity and shame of white culture found its hiding place and its rallying cry. Next Tuesday, this nation will go to the polls. And I hope I am wrong. But I predict that we white Anglo-Saxon Protestants will once again show what power really is. Dr. Wolf went on at this point in the sermon to predict how Democrats and Republicans across the country would elect leaders who would kill the war on poverty and would begin to reverse the gains of the civil rights movement. 
All of his specific predictions were not correct, but his overall point proved correct. The social and political tides had begun to turn. A white backlash, even among many whites who had been inclined to the goals of the civil rights movement, was seen in local, state, and national elections. And just at the moment when white people in America were starting to have to face a moral reckoning about racial justice and violence in white culture and in the status quo, the backlash against black power began to help erode broader white support for black advancement. Dr. Wolf concluded his message with these words. I also predict that when it's over and a year or so from now, maybe in time for the next big national election, we will feel like I felt after I had made an ass of myself telling off the head waiter. We will feel childish and stupid. I predict that when it's all over, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant electorate in this country will feel like I would have felt had I stormed down to my neighbor's house to punch him in the nose for making my little girl cry. We will feel juvenile and ridiculous. I predict that when the works of this newly elected Congress are over and the Lester Maddoxes and the Lurleen Wallaces have done their utmost in the state houses of this nation, we will feel like I am sure I would have felt had I given in to those feelings of revenge and hatred and bitterness and resentment I told you about, we will feel sick at heart, empty and debased. White folks might feel justified having defeated those, quote, uppity Negroes. We'll have put Stokely, the Stokely Carmichaels in their place. And all of the pontificals, I told you so's, will have come true. Or so we will think, but we will feel ashamed. For there is a principle that goes right to the very nature of things. It is one of the most ancient and venerable of all truths. Anyone who has ever told off a head waiter knows. Anyone who has ever lost his temper or flexed his muscles knows. It is human nature that we will resent in anger the threats made against us. Though we know that the reward for such resentment will inevitably be a heavy heart. It's human nature to return proud words for proud words. It is human nature that we will seek to return might for might. It is human nature, all right. Though the urgent truth is, we are called to a higher nature. Martin Luther King reminds us of this when he says that he will return love for threats. That he will suffer our bombs and insults and it will be he who ultimately will win not only his freedom, but our hearts as well. And that is what will happen. Because that is the way the world is made. You can no more stop things from working out that way than you can stop the sun and its course across the sky or the seasons from changing. It is a relentless principle. Said the ancient prophets, this is the word of the Lord, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. We are called to a higher nature. Unfortunately, we will not answer it this week in the polls. Rather, we will shame ourselves. But in due time, in due time, we will remember justice and forgiveness and the love that brings a double victory to those who suffer. And Dr. Wolf walked out of the pulpit with those words. Courageous words from a white preacher to a white congregation in segregated Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1966. The 
the white only signs, most having been taken down along Brookside, only recently, some still up around Tulsa and certainly throughout Oklahoma. The schools still segregated. Water fountains at City Hall and the courtroom still separated, colored and white. Only right around then, people talking about changing it. They said that for white preachers back during the civil rights movement, the scariest moments of their week were standing in the pulpit. They were scared that they would say the wrong thing and their congregations would throw them out. But this congregation never threw out Dr. Wolf. People told me time and again, they left so mad sometimes after his sermons. And, but by the time the week, you know, by about midweek, they realized whatever they thought about it, they certainly didn't want to resemble the people that Dr. Wolf was talking about on the other side. And so they came back and they were glad they did. A year later in 1967, uh, Dr. King, who had been, you know, being assailed on every side by people in the movement trying to tell him that nonviolence was a mistake and that it needed to be given up. He stated to the Southern uh, Leadership Conference, let us be dissatisfied until the day when nobody will shout white power, when nobody will shout black power, but everybody will talk about God's power and human power. And then in his book of the same year, 1967, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community, King stated, in the final analysis, the weakness of black power is its failure to see that the black man needs the white man and the white man needs the black man. However much we may try to romanticize the slogan, there's no separate black path to power and fulfillment that does not intersect with white paths. And there is no separate white path to power and fulfillment short of disaster that does not share that power with black aspirations for freedom and human dignity. We are bound together in a single garment of destiny. The language the cultural patterns, the music, the material prosperity, and even the food of America is an amalgam of black and white. May it be so. Amen. with us online today. We love connecting with people all across the country and around the world sharing our powerful message of love beyond belief. There's something new happening here. You can now join All Souls as a virtual member. Our virtual membership is designed for friends who live outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma and who want to engage with All Souls in a meaningful way. You can be part of an expanding family, a global family really, wherever you are. If you live in Oklahoma, Ohio, 
or Orange County, California, Canada, or Cameroon. By becoming a virtual member, you'll be able to deepen your connections with members and friends here in Tulsa and with members wherever you are. Each week, you'll receive special All Souls content tailored for you, our virtual members. Virtual members have access to pastoral care, to personal prayers, and also receive invitations to exclusive web events. You can learn more, and if you're ready, you can become a virtual member today by visiting allsoulschurch.org forward slash virtual membership. We're grateful our ministries are having a positive impact on your life, and we want to share the good news of Love Beyond Belief with more and more people. So no matter what, we need your support to keep this ministry growing and thriving. So please consider making a gift today. You can do so by texting Love BB for Love Beyond Belief to 73256 or simply visit our website. You are a blessing in our lives. May you be blessed. And be a blessing.